I, I like dinosaurs. I dig dinosaurs. <laughs> so far, I've had the privilege of being the director of the excavation that has discovered how many dinosaurs? 17 so far. It was 16 the last time I saw you. It's 17 now. Uh, a juvenile triceratops. Wow, that's a lot of fun. So I like dinosaurs. So dinosaurs are incredibly interesting. But dinosaurs are the poster child, the poster boy of evolutionary theory. Dinosaurs are supposed to be brute, cruel beasts, Tyrannosaurus rex, king, tyrant, lizard, destroying everything in his wake. And what he left behind, Velociraptor would come along and just shred to pieces. Hmm, was it really that way? Did you know that dinosaurs are in the Bible? Job chapter 40, verse 23. Behold now behemoth, which I made with thee, he moveth his tail like a cedar. Wow, he sways his tail like a tree swaying in the wind. He moved his tail like a cedar. He's the chief of the ways of God, the biggest, most dominant thing that God made on planet Earth. We used to think that the big blue whale, 110,000 pounds, was the largest thing on planet Earth. Not so. It, of course, is Argentinosaurus or Seismosaurus, are one of those in that category, weighing up to 200,000 pounds and reaching almost 150 feet in length. Those are dinosaurs. So behold now, behemoth, which I made with thee, he eateth grass as an ox. He moveth his tail like a cedar. And then it describes uh, his sinews wrapped together with his bones. Well, why is that important? Well, hang on. In a moment, I'm going to show you from the technical literature how that's vitally important. But the Bible said it first. Uh, the Bible stated first, the sinews, that is the musculature of his bones, are wrapped together. And it's in the same context with his tail. And that is very, very significant. So, let's just get down to business, talking about dinosaurs. T-Rex being king tyrant lizard, at least by reputation. Strethiomimus here. And then we have Velociraptor with his claws. Velociraptor with his claws is right there. Dinosaurs and pterodactyls. Uh, class, how many different kinds of dinosaurs are there? I've had the privilege, along with our CEM team, of discovering 17 different dinosaurs. The first I discovered along the banks of the Paluxy. That was a big Acrocanthosaurus. He was 40 feet long, and, and we have most of his skeleton. Uh, in the world of paleontology, if you discover 19 to 25 percent of a dinosaur, that's considered to be a complete dinosaur. Because no matter what area of discovery is made, they're able to extrapolate, to, to infer from that, this bone has to be connected to that bone. If it's a short bone, it connects this way. If it's a long bone, it connects that way. If it's a joint, et cetera, et cetera. So they are able, with a, a high degree of precision, to build the anatomy of a complete dinosaur, sometime on a single bone. Now, that's suspect, but at least in theory, it's possible. And many of the dinosaurs that are famous were built on a single bone. Now, you saw, as you came in the museum, the replication of two legs of the big Camarasaurus that I discovered in Colorado. Uh, we thought it was a big Stegosaurus and then more refinement. And then we thought it was an Apatosaurus, but more refinement. And now we know from the final toe bone toe claw that we discovered that it's a marasaurus. But all of those are in the same genera. And even the professional paleontologists wait long years before they publish because they want to be absolutely sure that tiny little bump, if you were to look very closely at that big femur, there's a little extension on the side, just a tiny little bump extension. That has to do with musculature. 
That has to do with the profile of the entire dinosaur. Just that one slight variation. So you have to get enough bones to make all of that work together, or at least to be interpreted together. So how many dinosaurs are there? According to the United States Geologic Survey, survey 300 valid genera, and you can have various offsprings uh, within that, 300 valid genera of dinosaurs have been discovered, even though 450 have been given names. Now, help me out. What's the difference? Sometime even the most gifted paleontologist, and, and I commend those fellows. Now, unfortunately, in order to work for a major university, you have to be an evolutionist in interpretation, uh, by interpretation of the bones, which turns out to be very suspect itself. I used to be an evolutionist. I know evidence that's claimed just isn't there at all in so many areas. But back to the idea. These paleontologists are very intelligent individuals, but sometime you can get a male and a female mixed up. For instance, in nature, who has the most flamboyant plumage, the male or the female? The male has. But in humankind, aren't you glad it's not like that? <laughs> depending on the plumage or depending on the profile of the head, you can think it is a different dinosaur altogether when it really turned out to be male and a female. And apparently, I, I use the word plumage, apparently dinosaurs sometimes were colorful creatures. We get the idea they were drab, dirty gray, like that other picture back there that's an old sketch of dinosaur. We get that idea. <coughs> but first of all, when this lecture is over, please take time to look inside the sealed case on the other side of the central section and see an actual piece of dinosaur skin. Very, very rare. Most so-called dinosaur skin at the major university uh, museums is simply skin impression. This is the real dinosaur skin. We had it run through CAT scan. It has the epidermis, has the dermis, has the fatty tissue, a third layer. Third layer? Are you awake? Do you know that the chameleon has a third layer that is basically what we would call fatty tissue? And what's so special about the chameleon? He can change colors. He can blend in with his environment. Oh, that opens the door for the possibility that dinosaurs to some degree could camouflage themselves that's not all. If you look closely at that piece of dinosaur skin, again, it is very rare. Most dinosaur skin is just impression of dinosaur skin. However, uh, in Canada, a few weeks ago, they announced the discovery that had been made a few years ago, but, uh, and then later a discovery by an excavation team, non-professional excavation team, of an entire dinosaur with all the skin on him, totally lithified stone, but the skin on him. But this is a much better quality than the one in Canada. If you look very closely, it has rosette patterns. Hmm, what is a rosette pattern? A floral pattern, where one petal off to the side of the center actually becomes the center of other petals around it. And each of those petals becomes the center of another. It is a constant floral display. Dinosaurs look pretty? Well, they sure had beautiful design. That's not all. The United States Air Force has an advanced x-ray machine where they can actually determine the inference of color from fossil material. Paleontologists were able to have one of the best dinosaurs scanned at the United States Air Force Laboratory, and they found variation in the skin pattern so that that dinosaur had stripes. Zebraic dinosaur, that should be a new name. 
Wow, dinosaurs could have been exotic. I know pterodactyls were exotic because I've led three scientific expeditions into the jungles of Papua New Guinea after hearing reports from uh, United States Air Force personnel, Intel. I've led three expeditions into the jungles of Papua New Guinea in search of living pterodactyls. We made five sightings after dark. We were not able to get close. They're smarter than we are. They're very elusive, and we're going to learn in a few moments how they were so elusive. But these, uh, these pterodactyls have a name by the locals. They know the difference. Uh, were any of you, uh, no, you're not old enough to have been in World War II. My dad was. Have any of you been in the South Pacific, PNG, Papua New Guinea? The missionaries hear reports by the nationals of a creature, not the flying fox. They, those nationals are not uh, imbecilic. They're very intelligent. In, in their world, they're smarter than we are. Those nationals certainly know the difference between the flying fox, which is an exotic flying creature, and these creatures they call Dewas or Ropin. Two names for them. They're, they're creatures that are grave robbers. For a few weeks after burial, these creatures will do their best to dig the corpse up. They do not embalm in Papua New Guinea, and uh, they have been known to succeed and literally dig the corpse up and devour it before the terrified loved ones. Uh, Sixty different people, broad daylight. Normally these creatures are nocturnal. They prefer to be. They glow in the dark. They can glow at will or they can diminish their light at will. We saw five of them glowing, and then we got relatively close. They diminished the light, and they were just a part of the landscape. But uh, that's pretty exciting. Um, I hold a permit to import four of them into the United States for research. But you've got to catch them first. <laughs> and they're smarter than we are. It's, it's their world. Uh, there was a report verified by the entire community. Normally, they're nocturnal. They use their light as a fishing lure. They skim over the waters, glowing, and of course, the fish come up and they turn around and go to lunch, take fish to lunch one way. <laughs> Some of you crappie fishers, fishermen, do you ever fish for crappie at night? What do you do? To catch them, well, you put a lantern, put a lantern next to the water in your boat, and you just catch crappie all night. So maybe you haven't done it, but you try it. You like to crappie fish? You know, anyhow, anyhow, that's how they do it in Missouri, and, and it apparently works for them. Uh, so the fish in God's creation knew it first. So they skim very low with their light, and they can turn that light from red to green. Wow. It glows under their chest. They can turn it on and off. Many creatures in nature, in God's creation, are bioluminescent. There are frogs that are bioluminescent. There are fish that are bioluminescent. Anyhow, back to the pterodactyls. So, there was an old man in this village who had an advanced stage 4 cancer. And some of you in the health sciences, and I'm sure there are individuals in this audience in the health sciences. We need that area now more than any other. Uh, some of you in the health sciences recognize that often particular cancers in the advanced stage give off a terrible odor. You know when you walk into the room of a cancer patient, terrible odor. Well, this old man had advanced cancer. And the people in Papua New Guinea are not quite as big as we are on average. We have too much. And we've eaten all of it, haven't we? So, broad daylight, this pterodactyl flew in, isolated this one old man from everybody else, swooped down, picked him up, took him about, 50 feet in the air, that's high, dropped him, 
but it didn't kill the old man. So he swooped down again, picked him up, higher, dropped him, and it killed the man this time. Sixty people saw this at one time. And then he swooped down and ate the man, devoured the man before them. Uh, all of that happened just a few years ago. And that is somewhat commonplace, relatively commonplace, in Papua New Guinea. These creatures are called Dewas or Ropin, and their membranes are very thin. Which brings me to this. Five weeks ago, our team was in Kansas on a private ranch excavating fish. Kansas is known for fish, and we were primarily excavating zephactinous fish. That's a predator, gruesome, ugly fish uh, that normally is about that long. It can get that long. One was found 14 feet long who swallowed a four-foot partner. Be careful running around with zephactinous fish. <laughs> and uh, that's on display at the Hayes Museum. So we were there for the excavation, and the landowners for years had wanted us to discover a pterodactyl. Well, guess what? Five weeks ago, we discovered a pterodactyl on the property. It is now being prepped. We have not only a joint in the shoulder area, it appears that we have the three small fingers and the long finger. That's real exciting. Uh, you almost never find a complete pterodactyl, and the skin is extremely rare to find. But there are two patches of the skin that we found as well. And the landowners are paying to have it professionally prepped and displayed. And after that's done, guess where they want to contribute it? Here, to the Creation Evidence Museum. So you want to come back again and again. Dinosaurs and pterodactyls are a lot of fun. So, back to how many dinosaurs are there and uh, why does that number uh, in Congress? 300 real genera, but 450 been named because sometime they got the girl and the boy mixed up. It's now realized that many of these belong together. But it's also estimated by the U.S. Geological Survey that between seven and 900 new dinosaurs remain to be discovered. Wow. So, we're going to be excavating on the McFall property this next week. We do it one week a year. And we have found a few bones from time to time. So, stay tuned. Log on to our website for news. What's our website? CreationEvidence.org.